So good morning, everyone. Dobre rano. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Pilsen, which is strange because I'm not Czech, as you probably can tell. But it's a great honor to have you here. This is the home of Pilsner Urquell. Pilsner Urquell, in English, broadly translates as Pilsner from the original source. So I guess you'll find out more about it later. And some of you are familiar. I look at some familiar faces from Asahi Pilsenski Prazdroy. So welcome. So what I thought I would do um, is try to introduce you a little bit to the Czech brewing industry, but not too much because you probably, some of the people in the room definitely know more than, than me about the details of the industry. What I do want to is present to you how innovation is fundamentally changing the landscape in this market and how, and, and how we've managed that. So to start, I hope you agree, and I hope I'll convince you, that at Polzenski Prazdroy, we are highly committed to tradition. Um, Vaslav, I think you will meet him uh, today, he's here. Um, we care a great deal about our traditions, but what is a tradition? Uh, people get confused, I think. So people think tradition means things from the past, old things. It's absolutely not true. Tradition actually is something of great value that you want to preserve and pass on. And if you want to do that, you must innovate <laughs> because you must make it relevant and interesting for the new generation. And industries or brands or processes which have not survived they have not survived, maybe because they're not very good, or they're good and they haven't innovated to be relevant. I'll take you, hopefully, through some examples of what that looks like. So I'm going to talk, do that by talking about seven myths. Uh, these are seven things I've heard in my career. Reasons not to do innovation, reasons that we shouldn't be creative, reasons that we shouldn't progress. Uh, of course, some of them are related to Czech, but some of them you may have heard yourself. In fact, some of them you may think yourself, uh, in which case, good luck. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of take you through a bit of that, okay? It's Czech market. Uh, you can find some of this on Wikipedia, but I've highlighted in red two of the more interesting things uh, that you probably know. The highest beer uh, consumption per capita in the world is in the Czech Republic, and beer is about 42% of all beverages which means we've got tremendous opportunity for growth. <laughs> it's not even half. So we consider this great, great opportunity to expand uh, the role of brewed beverages in the portfolio of Czech consumers. It's a fantastic market because the consumers in Czech, uh, they care a lot about quality. They care a lot about the intrinsics of products. So marketing people like me, we cannot get away with just fancy advertising. You have to make great products in this market. So a very, 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 very brief history of Czech beer looks like this. Uh, the modern Czech beer started in 1842 here, when the first Golden Pilsner was created. Uh, the second, uh, and after that, all basically all beer ended up looking uh, uh, and mirroring that kind of concept of the Pilsner-style lager. Then there was an important period, not a great period in the history of the country, as you know, between 45 and 90, where there was central control, where the price of beer was basically uh, controlled centrally and it was all the same. There were lots of breweries. Every region had its brewery and people drank beer all the time. This was the peak years of the beer market because in, when you were working in the factory, you had a low alcohol, low gravity beer as a refreshment. After work, you had beer. During the weekends, you had beer. You had beer, you had beer, you had beer. You had beer. Lots of beer. A kind of capitalist economy, of course. Then, afterwards, there was consolidation. So the big breweries entered the market, and there was investment into the breweries to sustain the quality, to make sure that we produced the same high quality all the time. But during that phase, uh, brands started to become nationalized, and many brands, many breweries in the, in the process disappeared. And really, it stayed like that for a long time. But the past 10 years, we've seen a resurgence of innovation, innovation and growth because how do you grow in a market where the per capita consumption is over 140 liters? You cannot sell more beer, not really. You can sell better beer, more diverse beer. Perhaps you can use your assets to create products for new different occasions. And that's basically what we've seen uh, in the last few years. So myth number one, there's nothing we can do about the on-trade. The on-trade is declining everywhere, all European countries, more or less nothing we can do. In the Czech market, it's true, the on-trade is almost 40% of total sales. It ain't growing. One of the main reasons, and something you can do about it, is pricing. So when a consumer is asked to pay about two times the price for a beer in the on-trade versus on-trade, we know they're quite happy to do that. They understand that. They value that. When it gets beyond three to four times the price, they say, I'm not stupid. 
something is not right here. Why are you asking me to pay so much more? Which is why at the top, we, we measure very carefully the price difference between the two channels. And in our business, we seek to keep the price difference fair because we want to protect the trade. If you go to places, I've been to Germany and seen a beer in an off trade, the same beer in a pub, and it's five times the price. <laughs> no one is going to buy that unless something is different. So create difference. So what do we do? We've innovated concept pubs. So we bring, up, bring alive brands and we create better environments. Because in this market, uh, many of the on trade are owned by small entrepreneurs. They are not trained by McDonald's HQ. They're not necessarily experts at hospitality. So we need to help them and develop their skills in running a business. But we also need to show to the consumer that the environment uh, you know, can be better. We also produce unique products that we will never sell in bottles or cans. We only produce them for the on-trade. So whether those are unfiltered products, whether those are unpasteurized products that we only sell uh, in the on-trade, or whether they're special variants, for example, Gambrinus 11 uh, gravity beer, which we will only sell in this channel, so that the channel itself gets something exclusive and, spe and special. Because if you're asking someone to pay two or three times more, why would you give them the same product? So that's one of the myths, number one, of the brewing industry. The beer should be the same in both channels, despite the fact the prices are fundamentally different. And the consumer has told us they're not willing to do that anymore. And the other thing we do, and if you look at the pack split, you'll see uh, how uh, kegs, as you would imagine, are dropping. But tank beer, tank beer is growing. And tank beer, as you probably are aware, is when you deliver directly from the brewery into the pub. So when the consumer uh, drinks the beer from the tank, it's unpasteurized, fresh from the brewery, typically less than two weeks old. So beer tastes great when it's that fresh. And they get it. So our tank business, despite the entree growing, is growing very quickly. We're growing very well with tank pubs. And we changed our mind. We used to hide the tanks under the ground because we thought, well, it's just a logistic solution, right? <laughs> and of course, the is, no, no, show the consumer. Look what you're getting, fresh beer come from the brewery and of course they're willing to pay more for that because they get it they get the taste difference so innovation in on trade does work and it does help you grow in, in the outlets where you do the innovation all of our concept pubs and all of our time pubs are growing much faster not only than our other other pubs but than the market itself um, second one of course when I came people said well look Grant you're British you know all that checks won't pay more you know, they're careful with money. I thought, geez, maybe they don't know Scottish people very well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're not going to buy expensive beer because the basic beer is pretty good quality here, right? It's total nonsense. Look at the category growth. This is the shape of the category by price segment. Economy beer drops and drops and drops. Mainstream beer is dropping. And there's big percentage growth in super premium and premium beer. When consumers say, I don't want to pay the price, what they mean is, you're not telling me why I should pay it. So... In this market, people care about the quality of the product, uh, so you need to give them a reason to buy it. But premiumization, we see it all across Europe. And of course, in this market, it's preserved one of the great traditions of brewing. This is a great example of a tradition. It's a terrible shame it doesn't exist anywhere else. It's, of course, the laws of gravity. So 10 degree, 11 degree, 12 degree Plato are communicated to the consumer. The consumer understands, like in the whiskey industry, those of you that work there, 10 years old, 12 years old, 18 years old, the higher it is, the more I pay. It's what we call in marketing a simple premiumization ladder. So you get more for your money, and it works. It also helps the beer to do the two things every beer category wants to do, provide easy and, and lighter drinking with rich and full taste drinking. So if we could go back in time, this is a tradition we should have preserved. But how much should you pay for a beer? So Pilsner Urquell, beer is cheap in Czech, relatively. It's fantastic quality, relatively, relatively actually quite cheap. So in a supermarket, Pilsner Urquell is usually less than one euro for a bottle. But how much will you pay? It depends how you package it. So at Christmas this year, or last year, people paid 6,500 euros for one liter of Pilsner Urquell. One liter of Pilsner Urquell. That's quite a lot of money. Why? Because, of course, the packaging around it, it was a charity event. We, we made 10 unique Crystal Moser decanters. You could come to the brewery, fill them, probably more than once for that price, uh, and people are willing to pay for beer. So that's the other thing. People don't want to pay for beer. It's absolute nonsense. You have to provide and present your brands in a way that demonstrates their value. Uh, you have to show them 
that, that there's something great and special about this, that when they drink it, they're drinking a part of history, but a part of history that's relevant today. And of course, uh, you have to make it exciting for contemporary new generations by activating platforms which respect tradition of those platforms, but also bring modernity. The thing, of course, I heard here is, you know, Grant, in this market, it's Lejac, Lejac, lager, lager, lager. No one wants anything else. I said, oh, I understand. Have we ever tried to offer them anything else? Well, we tried once on a Tuesday, but they didn't like it. So you have to try a bit harder. So in the retail market, you can see the shape how the market is going. So 10 degree, the cheaper beer is declining. 12, 11s are growing. And what we call ostatni, other things are growing. And on the right-hand side, you can see what those other things are. So cider has come from nothing five years ago. It did not exist in this market. Non-alcohol beer, uh, beer, which we described as flavored and non-flavored, is a significant part of the market. And if I was to show you this chart in Slovakia, you would see that non-alcohol beer is 15% growing of the total beer category. 15% by volume and almost 18% by value. And 10 years ago, it simply didn't exist. So that's the first one. No one wants non-alcohol beer. <laughs> Why would you drink non-alcohol beer? Heard it all the time. I think it's because we think that, you know, it's a compromise, a negative choice. But we kind of got the idea that maybe in Czech Republic there are people who drive cars. We understood that concept. So we said, look, we should do a beer for car drivers or truck drivers, right? And it seemed to work pretty well. So we made a great, great liquid because we understood the big insight was the reason people don't drink non-alcohol beer is it doesn't taste nice. It just really doesn't. They're very disappointed. As a British person, every time I tasted the non-alcohol beer there, it was just really bad. But Bidel, because of the way it was produced authentically using a special yeast, it tasted really good. And it worked really well for a lot of years, so we grew our volumes very nicely. And then in 2012, they declined because Rattlers came. And we said, oh, well, that's that. There's something better come along. Uh, and we said, well, maybe we should actually innovate and actually do something else with non-alcohol. Like what? Consumers said they're, they're quite okay. And this is one of the insights in innovation. Don't always ask the consumer. They can't tell you the future. So we said, what if it's a single serve adult soft drink? And instead of talking to men like we always seem to do with beer, let's talk to everyone. Uh, let's talk to people who are healthy and active. Let's talk about refreshment. Let's talk about positive choice. And let's try and make it a bit more exciting. So we did. And this is today how Bidel, our non-alcohol beer brand, looks. We still have the classic uh, beer tastes. In fact, we have three or four varieties of those. But we have a sweeter profile, so the, the Radler type product. But we also have a highly complex and sophisticated botanicals product. And we've basically doubled the sales of Birel in the last five years. Year to date, it's growing at almost 30%. It is explosive because it's accessing occasions which are soft drink or non-alcoholic occasions. Um, of course, it's changed the way we market this brand. It's not a beer. It's an active adult social soft drink. So changing the way we saw the world helped us to uh, basically exploit an enormous opportunity. Czechs won't drink cider. Never heard of it. Don't know what it's for. What the hell? So we did some research. They said, yeah, I don't want it. But we did it anyway. <laughs> we did it anyway because we realized in other beer drinking countries, cider was growing very quickly. And we reckoned if we presented it to the Czechs, a low alcoholic, tasty so uh, alcoholic drink, why would they not want it? So we, did, we launched a brand called Kingsweed, which is what we call category opener, introduced people to the concept of cider. We told them, never heat your beer. Don't put heat and beer together. But cider, you can have hot cider instead of that horrible hot wine that you have to force to drink at Christmas. And it worked. And therefore, we launched another one, or relaunched a brand called Frisco, which grew 50% last year. Frisco was a, a good concept that was with a bad product in the past. It was a malt-based drink, so kind of brewer's what I'd call the brewer's ladies beer. But by changing it to a cider, the taste remained very similar, almost the same, but people viewed it's made, it's cider, it's made of apples, it's healthier, it's more natural, and it worked well. And of course, as a result, the market in Czech Republic is growing and growing and growing, um, and, and Frisco has helped that growth in the last year. So even when no one's heard of it, that's probably because no one's told them what it is. Uh, one of my favorites, don't change the recipe. Don't change the recipe, because everyone will run away. So we have a brand called Gast, and the first brewmaster, his idea was to make the beer more bitter than other beers. Um, and I don't know if he 
why, all the reasons why he wanted to do it, but it, it did actually link very well with the region it comes from. It comes from a region of North Moravia. It was a hard region, so there was steelworks, mining, you know, difficult industries. It was, it was a hard place to live. And the guys there had resilience. The people there had resilience. And so bitterness, you know, strength of bitterness, uh, seemed to be kind of linking also to the cultural norm there. So we made this bitter, uh, he made this bitter beer. Everything was going okay. But uh, when I arrived and I said, so is the beer today, you know, more bitter than the other beers in the market, the other mainstream beers? People said, not really. I said, so we've got a claim, a fantastic claim, Jivot Yehoshki Bohodik, life is bitter, thank God, but we don't actually deliver the product. So let's change the product. Whoa, don't change the product. Don't change the product. Everyone will run away. We did change the product. We made a product which lived up to our claim. So we made it more bitter. We made it more expensive. And this is what I call true value engineering. So in the last four years, we've relaunched both of the core variants of Radagast. First, the 12 degree, the more premium, and last year, uh, the 10 degree variant. And what happened as a result is when we decided here that we just can't keep going like this and relaunch the product, uh, we engineered for value. So the consumer, despite we raised prices, bought more and more and more and more of Radagast because the product was better and it lived up to its promise. We didn't lose consumers, we gained consumers. Big, of course big can't do craft because they're all corporate people, right? And they don't care. But when you ask consumer what is craft, they say three things. One, the liquid has to be more complex, a little bit more complex. Uh, the, there has to be some kind of uh, authenticity or higher quality in the ingredients or the process, and there have to be people behind it. Okay, so at least all of those things, we have people, people work in our company. <laughs> people of passion, brewmasters, skilled people. We know how to do these complex projects, products, and we know how to make them drinkable. So we just started to do it. So we have a project called Volba Sladku, which means like brewmaster's choice. And in pubs, about 1,000 pubs, every month there's a different beer. These were the beers from 2017. And we just rotate it. We make a couple of batches. We send it to the pubs. When it's gone, it's gone. And it allowed us to experiment and it allowed some of our brewmasters to practice their skills at making top fermented products or new styles of beer. Um, and it's starting to really work. So the first year the consumer said, what's all this? Don't know what that is. Uh, and last year they started to say, I like this. Well, I'm getting excited. When's the next one? What is it next month? Um, and it grew 55%. Year to date, we're growing double digit. Uh, the consumer doesn't know the size. They just know the taste. Some of them they didn't like. <laughs> and some of them they really liked. So how much we make, how quickly we're able to respond is a key driver. This, by the way, is this month's, um, and it's an aromatic lager. So you'll see it in, the, in this program I've described, but we also have launched it as a limited edition or an account exclusive in one of our customers, uh, which is another way we've been able to speed up. So time from innovation, starting to finish, six months. Used to be like six years, I think. But now we do it much, much quicker. Uh, it's very important that we just speed up. So how do you get a big business to be quick? Just get on with it. And the people inside the organization have responded really well. And f last, and one of my favorites, is obviously ladies want ladies beer. Famous thing in, in the beer industry, right? So it's known that women don't drink coffee, right? That's obvious. Coffee's bitter, so they don't like it. It's known that women don't like chocolate. It's just a fact, right, in the chocolate industry that women don't eat. Therefore, it's a fact that women don't like beer because it's bitter. <laughs> so I think people's opinions uh, and facts get very mixed up. So when I worked in uh, Mars, chocolate company, and someone didn't like a product, they said it's too sweet. They didn't mean it's too sweet. I mean, I didn't like it. When they had a beer, when women have a beer they don't like, they say oh, it's too bitter. They don't mean it's too bitter. They mean I didn't like it. It's not complex. It's not interesting. And many times the industry has ended up giving them really sweet, horrible stuff. When we've done international marketing, we forgot to tell them they shouldn't drink beer. We didn't tell any women, don't drink beer. So we present our brands um, as highly accessible craft lager brands all around the world. And we just don't tell them it's not for them. We say it's for all adults. Everyone who likes this, everyone who uh, likes a refreshing alcoholic drink, you should get in it. So whether it's Pilsner or Urquell, uh, last two days I've been in Korea, and half the consumers are women or whether it's Velko Popovitsky Kozel, introducing rituals like cinnamon, uh, 
showing visuals that include multi-gender, we get half our business from women, of course. All of our advertising now has mixed gender. So, you know, one of the things we've learned is don't innovate for women. <laughs> innovate for human beings. Innovate for adults, you know, and when and women will like it or not like it together. End of story. And so last, last thing, um, what we've discovered, you know, in the Czech market is uh, there's tremendous talent here. People have great education, great passion for beer, and you just need to unleash it. Uh, taking our employees, showing them, taking them around the world to a mini brewery in Scotland, uh, showing them the great marketing from around the world, helping them win great marketing so that people come to check not just for the beer, which they do, but also for the marketing. You're able to do incredible things, and we've changed our business uh, from a business that made beer for men into a business that makes uh, adult drinks for a variety of the population. So my advice to you is ignore the myths and uh, go forward because the things we do which are valuable are too important uh, not to carry on to the next generation. And that really is what tradition is. Thank you. I think on that point, if you come into Pilsen, you'll see a big outdoor for Gambrinus, one of our brands, which says, uh, which basically translates as, when you just want a beer. Um, because I think the craft guys have done a lot of really important things for our business and our industry, because they brought forward the need to be more modern, exciting, and innovative. On the other hand, sometimes uh, they haven't spent enough time making the products drinkable. So there is also a market just for, uh, you know, going to the pub with friends. And for men's health, actually, on a serious note, it's quite an important thing to do. And the decline of the pub industry is a, is a threat, actually, not, not financially only, but also to societies. Uh, and I know in Britain, there's been a bit of discussion about this. So in Czech, it is a healthy part of society. Nothing else at all. So I think craft, my, my, point of, my point of view on craft is that it's far too important to be left to hipsters and the wealthy urban elite. So craftsmanship, all consumers deserve it at different price points. So, you know, a Gambrinus unfiltered um, is a form of craft. It's a more in complex and intense product. Um, it's been, has to be cared for in a special way because it's unpasteurized and unfiltered so it can't survive long, etc. And, you know, it costs uh, a euro 50, right? Um, so that's very important. We also have launched, you know, um, better versions or limited editions of our core brands because I think the snobbery of the craft, not, not from the craft people, to be fair to them, other people, is what will restrict it. So craft should be for everybody. Uh, it just comes with different kind of complexity levels. Yeah. So we do. So for example, this, this project here, if you go to some of the pubs, uh, I'm sure you will, the next evening, you will see on the table, there's a, a monthly we change the table stand, and it explains what is this product on the back, and it explains the origins of the histories. So for example, I didn't know about alt beer. I didn't know what it was, to be really honest. And I, I figured out, oh, that's what it is. It's really interesting. It tells the origin, where it came from in Germany, why it was called that, why it was done that. IPA, so IPA, which is a very new form of beer style in the last four or five years, to be honest, in the Czech market. We have to explain why is it called India Pale Ale, why was it made that way, and why does it taste this way. So it's very important to us, not only the tradition, so where it came from, but why was it produced, so the purpose of this. Um, and that's what people like. So why, why were there extra hops put in the liquid sent to India? Oh, it preserves it. All oh, right, that's really interesting. Why did they do it this way? Because behind why, there's people. Um, so I think the answer to your question is yes. When we took marketed cider here, which was obviously very new and modern for Czech Republic, we talked about the history of cider making 
in the UK and France and how it's a, a big tradition. So I think it's part of the story, but it's not the only part of the story. It's an excellent question. So one of the good things the craft industry has done is start to educate consumers. So if you went to a supermarket in most of Europe um, and you're not a beer expert, which is frankly most consumers, the only information you get is the brand name and the price. So your decision tree is based on how much it is. And some people say, well, I'll choose the most expensive because like, probably it's better. Or some people say, I don't care, I'll buy the middle. Um, if you only provide that, <laughs> that's how people will choose on price. I think we need to start in the retail, to the environments where people buy it. Uh, so the retail environments, there needs to be more education. And if you look at uh, Brewdog, um, they come from my home city, so I, I kind of like them. Uh, I think what they've done with their pubs has been excellent because the, the staff there are extremely knowledgeable. They provide more information about the product. They help you make a choice. Even if it's only things like ABV and sort of some ingredients, it's more than just a price. Um, and I think the big beer industry, the big beer players, I uh, have to do a much better job of that, much better job of that. Um, and it's mostly at the point of purchase because that's where people often make decisions. And the information they're given is just price. Usually it's price and brand name, to be honest. That's about it. Not all. The craft guys have done better at providing more. And we uh, have a program called Prasdroy Menu, which means if you own a pub, we have an online menu where you can download it. And in this menu, we provide the information about the beer, how it's made, what it tastes like, what would be an occasion recommendation, etc., uh, which means the pub owners can just copy and paste it. I mean, they just li literally download it and put their own prices, which has allowed us to get into thousands of pubs more information than price. <laughs>